Tonight, breaking news in the race for president with just 46 days to the election. Also tonight, the judge shot and killed in court. Authorities now say it was the sheriff who killed him. The drone used to find a little girl missing in the woods. You'll see the dramatic video and tracking deadly storms on the move across several states tonight. First tonight, Vice President Kamala Harris in Georgia. Her emotional comments about the death of a mother who she says could not get care in time after reports of medical help was delayed because of that state's strict abortion ban. And the other major headline from Georgia tonight, the move by officials there today to have every Georgia vote counted by hand, how that could affect when Americans learn who won the election. And tonight, former President Donald Trump soon heading to the swing state of North Carolina amid that scandal erupting surrounding the Republican candidate for governor. Trump once calling him Martin Luther King on steroids. The messages he's accused of leaving on a porn site message board. Trump still standing by him tonight. This evening, the judge shot and killed and now the sheriff charged in his murder. Authorities say the Kentucky sheriff shooting the judge multiple times in his chambers. Lawyers in the community say the two were once good friends. Tonight, Israel launching a deadly attack in Lebanon. They say killing a top Hezbollah military commander in Beirut. That commander also wanted by the U.S. for his alleged role in the massive bombings of the American Embassy and Marine Corps barracks in Beirut more than 40 years ago. Martha Raddatz live in the region. Back here in the U.S., the horrific crash involving firefighters, several in the hospital, two in critical condition at this hour when their fire truck flipped on the highway. The deadly storms on the move, several states in the path, heavy rain from Kansas City all the way to the northeast this weekend. Tonight, that remarkable video showing the rescue of a missing 10-year-old girl found with a drone in the woods. Tonight, with flu season now coming, a potential game changer. The FDA approving the first flu vaccine you can give to yourself at home, how it works. And the remarkable milestone seen by millions. Some now asking, was it the greatest game of all time? Who is our person of the week? From ABC News World Headquarters in New York, this is World News Tonight with David Muir. Good evening, and it's great to have you with us as we near the end of another week together here. We'll have more on that judge shot and killed in the courthouse. Authorities tonight now say it was the sheriff who killed him and what we've learned. But we do begin tonight with the race for the White House. 46 days to go to the election and the fierce fight tonight in the key battlegrounds. Vice President Kamala Harris in Atlanta, her emotional comments today about the death of a mother who she says could not get care in time after reports of medical help was delayed because of that state's strict abortion ban. The major headline also from Georgia tonight, that state's election board ordering the hand counting of all ballots, likely delaying results on election night in what could already be a very close election. And former President Trump soon heading to the must-win state of North Carolina as scandal now swirls around the Republican candidate for governor in that state, Mark Robinson, who Trump has praised as better than Martin Luther King Jr. Mary Bruce leading us off with late developments in the race for president. Tonight, Vice President Kamala Harris in Battleground, Georgia, a state that is putting a new spotlight on one of her campaign's key issues, abortion. This is a health care crisis, and Donald Trump is the architect of this crisis. Former President Donald Trump has boasted of appointing three of the Supreme Court justices who overturned Roe v. Wade. Georgia then implemented a law banning abortion at six weeks before most women even know they're pregnant. Harris today shining a light on the death of 28-year-old mother Amber Thurman, pointing to a ProPublica report saying she is the first woman known to lose her life as a result of Georgia's abortion ban. We will speak her name. Amber Nicole Thurman. Amber Nicole Thurman. Amber Nicole Thurman. After a medication abortion out of state was incomplete, Thurman suffered a grave infection. Her doctors waited 20 hours to operate. By then, it was too late, and she died. Overnight, Harris meeting with Thurman's mother at an event hosted by Oprah Winfrey. I want you all to know Amber was not a statistic. Mm. She was loved by a family, a strong family. And we would have done whatever to get my baby, our baby, the help that she needed. I'm just so sorry. Today, Harris blasting Trump and his running mate, Senator J.D. Vance, as hypocrites. The other folks, the, Trump and his running mate, and they'll talk about, oh, well, yeah, but I, you know, I, I, I do believe in the exception to save the mother's life. Okay, 
All right, let's break that down, shall we? Let's break that down. We're saying that we're going to create public policy that says that a doctor, a healthcare provider, will only kick in to give the care that somebody needs if they're about to die? Think about what we are saying right now. Harris arguing Thurman's death may be the first we are hearing of, but it won't be the last. We knew this could happen. There is a word preventable and there is another word predictable. So let's bring in Mary Bruce with us again tonight. Mary, the vice president, of course, in Georgia, as you reported there today, now headed to Wisconsin. I know there was another major headline out of Georgia as well today, this key ruling from the state election board. David, the Georgia State Election Board today, in a move spearheaded by Trump supporters, approved a ruling requiring that all ballots cast on Election Day be counted by hand, in addition to the customary machine count. Now, this decision is expected to be challenged in court, but if this holds, it could lead to a chaotic count and would certainly delay results in the critical state well beyond election night. In a very close presidential race already. Mary Bruce leading us off here. Mary, thank you. Former President Trump, meanwhile, headed to North Carolina tomorrow amid this growing scandal involving the Republican candidate for governor in that state, who Trump strongly endorsed, once calling him Martin Luther King on steroids. Rachel Scott on that part of the story tonight. Former President Donald Trump preparing to head to North Carolina, a long planned rally in a must win state. But it comes as scandal swirls around Trump's chosen candidate for North Carolina governor, Republican Mark Robinson. Trump has heaped praise on Robinson. I think you're better than Martin Luther King. I think you are. Martin Luther King times two. And tonight, Trump is standing by the candidate. Even as CNN reports, Robinson made a series of racist and inflammatory online posts, including one where he called himself a, quote, black Nazi. ABC News has not independently confirmed the reporting. CNN says Robinson made the comments between 2008 and 2012 on a pornographic website. The Republican, who was railed against transgender Americans, also allegedly posted about watching transgender pornography, calling himself, quote, a perv. And according to CNN, Robinson wrote that slavery is not bad, adding he wished it would come back. Robinson calls the report tabloid trash. Those are not the words of Mark Robinson. After the story broke, the Trump campaign releasing a statement calling North Carolina a vital part of their plan to win back the White House. Thank you. But no mention at all of Mark Robinson. And as of tonight, Trump has not withdrawn his endorsement. The Harris campaign quick to highlight their connection in a new ad. I've been with him a lot. I've gotten to know him and he's outstanding. Donald Trump and Mark Robinson. They're both wrong for North Carolina. Donald Trump's advisors say that winning North Carolina is critical to their chances of taking back the White House in November. Sources tell me that the campaign is trying to put some distance between themselves and Mark Robinson. Robinson is not expected to attend Donald Trump's rally in the state tomorrow, but still the former president showing no signs of pulling that endorsement, David. Rachel Scott and our Mary Bruce on the race for president tonight. Thanks, Rachel. It was last night here as we came on the air, we learned of that Kentucky judge shot and killed in his chamber. Tonight, authorities now say it was the sheriff who murdered him. Here's ABC's Faith Abube. Tonight, a tight-knit Kentucky community shaken. Its sheriff now charged with murder, accused of fatally shooting a judge in his chambers after an argument. That's the Electric County Courthouse. That shot's fired. Authorities rushing to the Electric County Courthouse southeast of Lexington, Kentucky, just before 3 p.m. Thursday, finding 54-year-old District Court Judge Kevin Mullins shot multiple times. Uh, life-saving measures were taken. However, we're unsuccessful. Lecter County Sheriff Sean Mickey Steins arrested without incident. Tonight, he's facing one count of first degree murder. The motive still unclear. Oh, we know that it was an argument between the two that led up, but uh, what exactly transpired prior to the shots being fired uh, still things that we're trying to get answers to. The sheriff, a former bailiff in the judge's courtroom. Mickey and Kevin were really close and good friends. I never saw any hostilities between them. Just three days before the shooting, the sheriff deposed in a federal lawsuit, a former inmate accusing him of failing to adequately train and supervise a deputy who sexually abused her in 2021 in the judge's chamber. The complaint does not allege the judge was aware or did anything wrong. The county's prosecutor recusing his office from the case saying the judge was a former brother-in-law whom his children called Unky. I always thought he was very witty. Um, He was fun to be around outside of court. 
And the judge leaves behind a wife and two children. In the meantime, David, a spokesperson for state police tells me they do have video of the deadly incident, but this investigation continues. David. Faith Abube with us tonight as well. Thank you, Faith. The major story overseas tonight, Israel launching a deadly attack on Lebanon. They say a top Hezbollah military commander was killed. At least 14 others killed, two dozens more injured. The target, Ibrahim Akil, was also wanted by the U.S. for the devastating bombing of the U.S. Embassy and Marine Barracks in Beirut. That was more than 40 years ago. In those attacks, 300 Americans were killed. And tonight, Martha Raddatz from the region again. Tonight in Lebanon's capital city, a targeted strike. Israeli warplanes launching missiles into the heart of Hezbollah territory. The dead, including one of the militant group's top commanders. Ibrahim Akil was a member of the group's Islamic Jihad organization, wanted by the U.S. for his role in the massive bombings of the American Embassy and Marine Corps barracks in the Lebanese capital back in 1983. This is the worst attack there has ever been against the United States in the Middle East. More than 300 Americans were killed in the bombings. The strike today reducing this Beirut block to smoking rubble. Rescue workers digging through the remains of flattened buildings are Marcus Moore in Beirut. This strike happened just before rush hour here in Beirut, and it marks the third major attack on a civilian part of the city just this week. According to Lebanese officials, at least 14 were killed, dozens more injured, the deadliest direct strike by Israel and Lebanon since October 7. The Israeli Defense Forces claiming to have eliminated other top Hezbollah operators who were hiding out underground. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warning in a statement today, our goals are clear and our actions speak for themselves. But earlier, Hezbollah launched its own strikes, air raid sirens sounding in northern Israel. With more than 100 rockets fired from Lebanon, a show of force by the militant group, crippled after this week's explosive attacks on their communications devices. And tonight, the national alert level here in Israel for emergency medical services has been raised to its highest level, meaning maximum level in case of war. But U.S. officials say they do not see signs that an Israeli ground incursion into Lebanon is imminent. David? Martha Raddatz in the Middle East all week for us. Martha, thank you. Back here in the U.S. and tonight, the acting head of the Secret Service blaming his own agency for a litany of failures in Butler, Pennsylvania that allowed a gunman to fire at former President Trump. Here's Pierre Thomas. Tonight, a damning new internal report from the Secret Service, revealing extraordinary communication and planning failures leading up to the attempted assassination of former President Trump in Pennsylvania, and a stunning admission of a lack of diligence by the Secret Service. There was complacency on the part of others that led to a breach of security protocols. Acting Director Ronald Rowe admitting agents never had a plan to secure the roof of a nearby building with a clear line of sight on Trump. Yeah, look, there he is. And never heard in real time local police radio traffic that the suspect was identified with a gun on that roof. So there was a lack of clarity that that roof should be secure, period, full stop. There was a uh, discussion about how the, the roof uh, was going to be secured, and I think what it came back to is we should have challenged what that, how that mechanism uh, was, was being implemented, meaning we should have been more direct. But tonight, Roe praising agents who protected former President Trump over the weekend in Florida during the second apparent attempt on his life. It appears that those agents, those supervisors, made swift decisions and made correct decisions. The Secret Service director is vowing employees involved in the Butler rally who failed to meet standards will be held accountable, noting that the agency has, quote, a robust table of penalties, David. Pierre Thomas, live in Washington again tonight. Thanks, Pierre. We're going to turn now to the horrific crash involving multiple firefighters. Several rushed to the hospital. In fact, two are in critical condition tonight after their fire truck flipped on the highway. Kena Whitworth in California tonight. Tonight, authorities in Orange County, California, investigating after this horrific crash that nearly killed a fire crew coming back from the front lines. Just before 7 p.m., the fire truck swerving to try and avoid a ladder in the middle of the freeway, rolling over multiple times. The mangled ladder 
seen on the pavement. You can see the entire length of that uh, incident, about 500 feet from the ladder to the resting spot of that firefighting truck there. You can see uh, what is left of this transport vehicle. It is completely, completely demolished. The truck carrying an eight-member Orange County Fire hand crew on their way back from working a 12-hour shift digging lines and clearing brush on the airport fire that's burned more than 23,000 acres near Los Angeles. All of the families were immediately notified. Our crews, as you can imagine, you know, are devastated. And David, six of those firefighters are still in the hospital, two in critical condition, and the chief saying tonight it's going to be a tough road ahead. David. Kena Whitworth live in California for us. Kena, thank you. Tonight, a January 6th rioter convicted of assaulting law enforcement at the Capitol has been sentenced to eight years in federal prison. Stephen Chase Randolph, seen in images and court documents pushing against a barrier at the Capitol. Randolph from Kentucky was originally identified through a facial recognition match using photos on his girlfriend's Instagram account. When we come back here on a Friday night, we're tracking deadly storms on the move, several states in the path, heavy rain from Kansas City, really all the way to the Northeast. And you'll see the remarkable video tonight showing the rescue of a missing 10-year-old girl in the woods. They used a drone to find her. They found her sleeping in the woods in a moment. Tonight, a deadly storm system moving east this weekend. Two reported tornadoes, in fact, touching down. This is near Duluth, Minnesota. At least one person was killed. Heavy rain now moving from Kansas City to Chicago to Pittsburgh. We're also tracking three potential tropical threats on the horizon, including one closing in on the Gulf of Mexico. It could become a named storm sometime next week. We'll track it. When we come back tonight, the remarkable images here. Using a drone, how they found a little girl missing in the woods. And then with flu season coming, a potential game changer tonight, the FDA approving the first at-home flu vaccine. You can give it to yourself. To the index of other news tonight, the remarkable rescue of a 10-year-old girl lost in the woods, roughly 40 miles east of Shreveport, Louisiana. A drone equipped with thermal imaging spotting her asleep, curled up in a ball right there. A company hearing about the massive search actually supplied the drone. Authorities tonight say she's okay and she's back home with her family. Tonight, the FDA giving the green light for the first ever at-home flu vaccine. The flu mist vaccine is a nasal spray, no shot needed. It can also be given to children and younger adults with a prescription. You can get it now from your doctor and in the pharmacy, they say, by next fall. The CDC does recommend flu shots for everyone six months and older. When we come back here tonight, the remarkable milestones seen by millions overnight, something never done before. Who is our person of the week? Finally, the Dodgers superstar now in a league of his own, our person of the week. It was the top of the seventh inning. Shohei Otani at bat for the Dodgers, and history was calling. On a one two, Otani sends one in the air. The other way. Back it goes. Gone. One of a kind player. One of a kind season. Shohei Otani starts the 50 50 club. Otani hitting his 50th home run of the season. His teammates right there beating him at home plate. The high fives, the hugs for a player like no other. Otani now the founder and sole member of the 50-50 club. Hitting 50 home runs, stealing 50 bases all in one season. No one has ever done it. No one has even come close. There they go. Throw to third. Beats him, but he got his foot in. The 50th for Otani. And the game wouldn't end there. Home run number 51. Otani, the greatest day in baseball history. Otani would end the game with three homers, two doubles, two steals, 10 RBIs, a six for six outing at the plate. Oh my God. And one lucky fan with the souvenir of a lifetime. This is the show that never ends. A dream come true for a player who, as a boy in Japan, not only mapped out his goals on this dream board, but also his plan to get there. Otani saying after the game he was, quote, happy, relieved, and very respectful to the peers and everybody who came before and played this sport of baseball. There it is! Number 50! Tonight, a one-of-a-kind player, a one-of-a-kind game, and for now, the one and only member of the 50-50 club. And so we choose Shohei Otani. What a game. I'll see you on Monday. Good night. Thank you for making World News Tonight with David Muir, America's most watched newscast.